So, morning everybody, my name is Jen and welcome to Law Hero and I discuss videos about the law and all other stuff, if you're interested. And today we're talking about uh, responsibilities and actually at this stage kind of soft law um, around being a trainee because this stuff, it was kind of there when I was coming up but now it's like set in stone um, and I'm getting this from the Law Society website but I just want to go through it because <clears throat> it's good to know these things before you go for interview because it shows that you've done your research. Obviously if you watch my channel before you go for interview you're going to be in great shape but also while you're a trainee it's important to remember these things so while you're training to be a solicitor and this is for like any in any jurisdiction this stuff is relevant but also it's actually a good reminder for when you're newly qualified because just because your title changes doesn't mean your responsibilities or anything like that changes so for solicitors we have like the solicitors acts uh 1954 uh and they were amended by the LSRA Legal Services Regula Regulation Act 2015 and so that that's how you know the profession is conducted in Ireland and then we also have um, a guide to good conduct for solicitors which is kind of old at this stage and it doesn't really take in social media um, but they're looking to change that maybe it takes a long time for stuff to change in the law society but I digress um, and I think, so I'm going to do another video on how what you do outside of work may affect your employment opportunities or while you're on the job. But I think social media is a massive grey area for solicitors. I don't think regulatory bodies like the Law Society, like the LSRA have dealt with it appropriately. They've not kept up with the times um, because it's, yeah, it's like confidentiality all that kind of stuff can be breached through social media and the problem is when you when you have clients who are high profile and a lot of people can make assumptions based on the kind of work you're doing who your clients are so you you can always be linked to these high profile clients when you're when you're uh, in private practice and then obviously if you're in-house you only have one client and what you do reflects that client even because you're an employee so I think people have to realize that everything you do is a reflection of your client like and I would say even more so than any other service provider even more so than accountants and um, I think we as solicitors a lot of the time we don't realize how important it is how we act and the things we say and the things we do how that links back to the, the client so that's what I kind of want to talk to trainees this morning about so they've already, the Law Society have already come out with a code of conduct for trainee solicitors and I actually think it's a very good idea um, and this has kind of come from, I would say, so like in, in the UK you might have seen they had this trainee who left um, a briefcase of documents on a train and then the question was should they be disciplined like a solicitor should be and in the UK they're very draconian like in the UK you can l lose your license for literally anything and it's probably an economic thing they have their pick of lawyers so they can just go look if you mess up you're gone whereas here in Ireland you have to do something really bad to be struck off as a solicitor and I don't think if an Irish trainee um, I don't think if an Irish trainee left a, a briefcase of documents on the dart that they would have lost their job. I just don't think so. I think we're a little bit more lenient here but in a good way because we understand that that person is training and we're not so draconian. That being said, when somebody is qualified in Ireland as a solicitor, I have seen some examples of um, you know, slap on the wrist. I saw one I remember a few years ago um, a newly qualified solicitor was having an affidavit witnessed and didn't put in the right signature block and basically the judge the judge made an example of them and then everybody was really oh yeah I remember they did, the person didn't swear on the bible so basically you take an oath you say I swear and if you're doing like the secular way, so non-religious, you say, um, I'm not a litigator, but I'm trying to remember. It's like, I declare or something like that. Um, 
you don't say I swear because you're not swearing on anything. Um, so yeah, they, they had an example made of them and that put us all on edge because we were like, oh, okay, like we all have to kind of be careful. And uh, the judge said something like, it doesn't matter that they're newly qualified. They should have known better. And then everybody was like, oh, okay, like maybe we're going down the UK route. But since then, I haven't really heard anything. And normally if someone is struck off in Ireland, it's usually, usually a general practitioner who has embezzled funds from their clients like the most famous one there was a few years ago i think it was in roscommon or longford um so the baby's the baby's dad so the, the client was the was the baby uh, the beneficiary of monies that was received from the father who died on a quad accident in madagascar and i was like 20 grand 20 or 30 grand was left for the baby and um, the solicitor went and used the money for his daughter's wedding and he bought a horse with the money and you're not allowed to do that uh, under the acts we have um, we separate client monies from office monies um, that you're not allowed to use that money for your own purposes uh, I've heard stories that in like the 50s and 60s that's how solicitors um, would operate they were like quasi financial institutions because they were in receipt of large amounts of funds which sometimes sat in their account to be held in escrow um, for example when they were in a property transaction but what they would do is they would use the money and they would leverage it to buy property and that's how they got on the property ladder because they were basically intermediaries for all of these funds coming and going and they just dipped in dipped out from client funds here and there and they would buy things with it and obviously that couldn't fly so that's why the regulations come in because if that's extremely risky you know with banks um when you call on your deposit the bank has already capital there there's this capital adequacy ratios under banking law and um when you go to the atm they will have borrowed money on the interbank market so that when you go to the ATM even though the money you initially deposited is gone they have gone and borrowed other money at different rates and that's how banks make money but solicitors were actually doing that and um, before all these regulations came in and you can imagine that they were probably pro profiting from it but also they were getting on the property ladder so that so for me when I heard that I was like oh okay you can kind of understand then why Solicitor had such a hallowed uh, reputation in Irish society and also how they became so wealthy so quick. But anyway, all of that is disallowed now and that was a massive tangent away from what I really want to talk about is how you conduct yourself as a trainee while you're in the office. So the problem with this in Ireland and I suppose it's the same in the UK is that for part of your training you go to Blackhall Place and Blackhall Place is where you get your legal education but let's be clear I mean you are there's not many hours that you go to Blackhall and you have a lot of downtime and when there's downtime and you're in your early 20s there's a lot of mischief and what I mean by mischief is there's a lot of hanging around trying to fill time and you can fill in the blanks there yourself so what happens is is that whilst you're still technically a trainee you're off having the crack because you're essentially getting paid if you're lucky enough you get paid by the big law firm if you're not you have to pay your own fees and those people tend to be a little bit more diligent around their time because the people who aren't having their black hall fees paid usually when they're not in Blackhall during the PPC 1 and 2, they're putting in time in their own law firms. Like, I know trainees who came from smaller law firms after class would rush off to go and work for their solicitor, which for the people like me who came from a big law firm, we were like, oh my God, imagine having to do that. Imagine having to pay your own fees. Imagine having to pay your own way. So it was a real privilege to have your fees paid by a big law firm. Um, and you also were lucky because you had a lot of downtime so that meant you could study more if you were diligent but most people didn't um and yeah I was one of those people who wasted a lot of time but this is what happens when you're in your 20s a lot of it's just um figuring things out so you know 
we're just human at the end of the day. Like I look back and I think, yeah, I wasted a lot of time. But anyway, please don't waste your time when you're on the PPC one and two, because if you have half a brain, you will realize that those are golden years. Um, and yeah, so what I'm trying to say is you're a trainee, even though you're down in whatever nightclub, whatever pub, I know it's COVID at the moment. So there's a lot of restrictions, but when things go back or from my experience, yeah, people forgot they were trainees and it's a catch 22 because you want to enjoy yourself. You're like, I'm getting paid to study or whatnot, which is basically like university, but I'm still an employee of a law firm. So yeah. And the media, like the media do like to target um, trainees on the PPC1, PPC2. Like I've seen so many articles where, you know, the media love like to have a go at it because they're like, oh, look at this elitist group of people who are basically carrying on as if, you know, they're getting they're getting paid to have a good time. And it's, it's not the truth, but I can I can see how they see it. So, yeah, um, According to the chase, there is now a code of conduct because there's a lot of things that have gone on. There's been WhatsApp groups. There's been kind of like sexist things that have happened. And of course, it's going to happen when you bring predominantly a lot of women because there's the ratio of men to women is like three to one. So if you're a man, you're going to have a great time in black hole place. And that's going to cause some mischief. And that's just human nature, especially when you're in your 20s. Now, I know not everyone who goes to black all places in their 20s, but the majority are. And I would imagine that's why they needed to bring in this code of conduct. Um, now, it centers around um, your, your in-office training. So it's like, you know, you have to act diligently. Uh, you should familiarize yourself with, you know, all the different uh, legislation um you know you should you have a duty of confidentiality you know even though you know all of that you have to be uh, ensure you're properly trained so it doesn't really go into um um kind of what i've been talking about there while you're in black hole place but there's a few places where they um where they could catch you so uh, paragraph two two a trainee solicitor should at all times act with honesty and integrity in his in his or her dealings with others. So that's really, really broad catch all. And I think that's kind of what they're getting at. It's not just when you're in the office, it could be outside of the office. So you have the duty of confidentiality and then you have the conflict of interest. And then um, there's one as well where they say, if you um, make a mistake, you should own up straight away. And there's another one that says, at all times, you should act consistently with the core values of the profession, which means acting with honesty and integrity, uphold confidentiality and avoid con conflict of interest. Acting with honesty and integrity, again, that's a catch all. And this is kind of, this is important because before there wasn't really, like it was an unwritten rule to behave properly, but now it's actually, a code of conduct and it can be used against you and the other thing as well which I find interesting is the attendance at lectures and seminars and independent work projects while in black hole place so the deal is it's kind of like university if you don't go um so, so lectures you can attend at your own discretion obviously it's better if you attend them and then tutorials they mark attendance um, if you miss a certain amount of tutorials your firm is told so uh, that does happen and then you have to go and speak with the head of education and like that's not a nice position to be in um, try and explain that to your firm why you've missed so much because like literally you've nothing else to do for the whole six months other than go to your lecture so they won't be happy about that um and then there's another one which I think is interesting, which is it's up to you. So this is kind of what I really want to get to in this video. It's up to you to ensure that you're properly trained. And I think when you're in a big firm and they have the resources to like roll out proper training, like everybody's being checked, like everybody 
is on the same page about training. I don't think it's such a big deal. I think this is more for the people in the small firms where the training ethos isn't such so well established. For example, if you're in a general practice or a business that's just starting up, to get proper training is more of a gray area. And for those, like those people come to me, I find, not the people in the big firms, because they're fine. The people in the smaller firms are far more vulnerable of not being trained well as a solicitor. Now, this is not for all small practices. Most small practices bring the trainee solicitor in to such an extent that they get fantastic training and they get a lot of responsibility very early on. Whereas in the bigger firms, it's more softly, softly, like as in you get more and more responsibility as you prove yourself. Whereas in the small firms, because they're so limited resources, they need the trainee solicitor sometimes to go to court. They need the trainee solicitor sometimes to deal with the client and the trainee solicitor is thrown in at the deep end in a small firm and that can be really good. But then if you're in a small firm where your training solicitor is a like compulsive micromanager or they don't trust you at all, you can be just put to the side, colouring in maps or doing photocopying and basically being another admin resource, which is you don't want that. So what they're saying here is that you're entitled to a reasonable standard of training and you should work together with your training, a training solicitor to find that. Um, and keep a record of what you're doing and what you learned. So like you have to keep a record of what you're learning because when they come to the end and they're like, what seats did you do? You need to be able to be like, yeah, I did one litigation seat because like there's a, there's a, you have to fulfill. Like I did one litigation seat at least. I did one uh, property seat or quasi property seat. And uh, I did one corporate seat or whatever. You have to be able to show that. Um. And then this is the next one, obviously, because this has been coming from some complaints. A trainee solicitor should address with their training solicitor, as appropriate and reasonable, any concerns that they have around the volume of work. Whether it's too much or too little, he or she is asked to undertake or the level of guidance being received by the trainee solicitor in relation to such work. This is massive because this is the first time where you actually have in a code of conduct that you can call out the person training you that it's too much or it's too little, which is fantastic. And you can always just go, listen, it's in the code. Like if they kick back and are like, you should be lucky that you got a training contract. No, no, no. Like don't let people hold that over you. Be like, you can't treat me like this, like this is unreasonable. Where a trainee solicitor perceives that he or she has made a mistake, they should immediately inform the training solicitor. A mistake can and does occur. Oh my God, people made mistakes. And if made, the trainee solicitor should do so and report it with honesty and integrity, irrespective of the potential consequences of doing so. And this is a really cultural thing. And I speak for everyone when you make a mistake, own up. But like it is the cornerstone of integrity is to own up. A trainee solicitor is expected to self-motivate. You can also motivate yourself by coming to my channel <laughs> and consider what is needed for their own professional development. And I think, remember when I told you guys before, so in the uh, how not to make a mistake video, sometimes it's a gap in training and not it, like no one's going to come and tap you on the shoulder and go, hello, I noticed that you have a gap in your training. Let me sort that out. No, like that's your responsibility because you know, your head the best and you know your blind spots the best other people are you know they're, they're not going to know you as well as you know you um and as far as practicable keep up to date with legal developments relevant to the work they're asked to undertake basically keep yourself i hate this word abreast of legal developments um a trainee solicitor 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 should seek to develop his or her own social and interpersonal skills and propose solutions to client related problems for consideration and discussion within the uh, training solicitor's office. So basically what it means is don't always wait to be asked the question. If you think you have a solution, propose it. What's the worst that can happen? They can go, oh no, like that wouldn't work because like a train, like a decent training solicitor is never going to go, that's stupid what you just said there. Just go back to your computer stupid little minion no one's ever going to say that to you unless they're a psychopath because like that is straight out you could complain them for that um a training solicitor should ensure that his or her training solicitor is duly instructed on ethical matters to the practice of law and the practice of the profession so it's up to the train sorry so this is the training solicitor 
they need to make sure that you are up to date on ethics like that's their responsibility so basically both of you sign this so you and your mentor or your training solicitor and you have to uphold it which is fantastic so yeah um, I hope this gave you all a little bit more information around training and because uh, I've been receiving a lot of questions around it and yeah just when in doubt be honest and like they say people people always act in their own best interests and yeah that's important but at the end of the day if you're acting in your own best interests to the detriment of others and like you're destroying reputation of the people you're working for is it really worth it um so yeah the next video we're going to talk about things you do outside the workplace how it can affect your prospects within the workplace so i'll see you then